Thank you. Uh, so yeah, my name's Tyke. My name's Tyke. My name's Martin. Sometimes it feels like that's my name, I guess. Uh, and I'm here to talk to you about the dark side of managing APIs. And there's our rather awesome mascot dressed up as Darth Vader. We've got to love the guy, right? We did nothing wrong. Anyway, so um, it's quite a hyperbolic title. Uh, thanks for the intro, by the way. Uh, yes, CEO, co-founder, Tyke Technologies. For you guys who don't know what we do, we're an API management, API gateway platform, and we're open source. And that's um, key for this particular talk, because um, it's a hot topic, right? And I say, general tinkerer, digital hippie, maker of things, and my co-founder seems to think that I'm some kind of liability. So we'll see. Anyway, so let's uh, get started. Now, a lot of these conferences, right, you guys are, we're talking about RESTful APIs, we're talking about services, sort of service-oriented architecture. Thank you for lending me this. This is very good. I left mine in the hotel room. Um, and we're looking at APIs. And I think at these conferences, when we talk about APIs, we tend to talk about APIs at the very highest level. Uh, we're talking about RESTful queries. We're talking about SOAP. We're talking about gRPC, um, you know, Thrift. Thrift was it? Yeah, Thrift. Uh, things like that, where we're talk still talking about these sort of HTTP layer of APIs. But, you know, everybody knows. API means application programming interface. And it's a very old term, right? And it's been around forever. We're using APIs when we are cutting some code and pulling in a library. We're using APIs when we're talking to a database. You're using an API when you send a print command to a job queue for your printer. They're all APIs. And it's easy to forget that. You've got to remember that they exist. So why am I talking about this? Get to the point, Martin. Well. Open source is a big deal. So when you're looking at your APIs and you are developing them as a product, and you're saying, okay, let's get this out there, this is the equation you want to you be getting to, right? You build up your usability, you build up your DevX, you make sure that people want to use your product, right? They want to use those APIs. It's really easy, to, easy and simple to use. That leads to adoption. Adoption means you build more, you've been successful, and you get more sales, you make more money, you've got more clients, everybody is happy. So what I want to focus on is this part of the API adoption lifecycle. Um, and I want to do a little bit of uh, ooh, hello. Um, I want to do a little <laughs> uh, I want to do a little bit of a word association game after this, um, after this bit. So what I want to get at here is when your adoption is really high and you start getting a lot of success. Um, you, there, there's this sort of winner-takes-all attitude within the API world, especially when it comes to lower-level APIs. You become the one to beat. You become the one that sets the standards. You set the, you set the tone of the conversation. It's not so much as an RFC as it is like, oh, well, no, Stripe do this. You should do that, too. Or Twitter do it this way. You should do that, too. Uh, somebody uses GraphQL. You should use GraphQL. Um, sorry, no. <laughs> Very different sort of size of services here. Um, Anyway, so adoption can lead to a point where you set the standard, right? That's great. You know, you have a lot of power. So I'm going to do a little word association with you guys. Try and get involved. Maybe you'll wake up after this, okay? So when I say in-memory database, who here is thinking about Redis? Hands up. Okay, how many non-developers are here, man? <laughs> okay, so not so many of you. Um, for somebody who didn't put their hands up, I want to throw up another one. SQ, I've never even heard of it. All right. Okay, well, I'm going to say Redis uh, because I think it's the one that comes to mind. But maybe that's just my, my little world. Um, what about a document store? Who here would say MongoDB? Okay, a much larger group. Thank God for that. Woohoo! Because um, you're right. That's sort of the one that, that's the one to beat. They set the standard. They are the one to copy. Yeah? What about SQL? When I say SQL, you say Postgres. Hey, right, there we go. You had somebody chiming in from out there, out there. Great, yeah, you're right. So Postgres, yeah? That's the one to beat. SQL is an unfair, unfair uh, sort of comparison because SQL is standardized already. It's not really owned by anyone. But none, nonetheless, Postgres is the one to beat in this particular space. So why am I telling you all this stuff? We all know it. Um, you know, either way, you get the point. Now, what I want to say is success means you're in the spotlight, and high adoption means that uh, you set the standard. So let's just start a little graph, 
We like graphs. De you know, diagrams are good. So let's say adoption goes this way, low to high. And then we add another axis for design flexibility in terms of your API from low to high. And when you're designing APIs and you first start off, and you're like, I'm going to create some software that's going to change the world. My service is going to change the world. You're up here. You've got a lot of flexibility because nobody's adopted your product yet. And you can change things. You can experiment. You can do all kinds of cool stuff. But very quickly, as you then launch and your adoption goes up, your design flexibility starts tanking. Yeah? And it's a very quick tank. Um, the next thing you know, you're sitting down here, and you can't adapt your APIs anymore because you have too many third-party dependencies, too many third parties using your API. And you remember, you, as you go up this, as you're over here, oopsie, as you're over there, you are successful. You're selling. You're making money. And that's important. And you don't want to be annoying the people that are paying you, do you? So it becomes more and more difficult to change your APIs. And your design flexibility starts going down the pan. So you have to start versioning, and you have to start thinking about doing V2s, and you have shims, and you have to expand your team. And you know, it becomes more and more complicated to maintain these folks. Now, there is a point to all of this. I'm just setting the stage. Um, and it's this here. Adoption puts pressure on you to conform and to standardize and stabilize your APIs. And that is good. Yeah, your customers depend on it. Your users depend on it. You don't want the world to break. And I don't know if anybody here was a Facebook developer back like 10 years ago and started building apps for Facebook, and then they just started changing the API every three months, break, you know, fail fast and break things, including everybody else's application. Um, yeah, so don't do that. And you can't because people depend on you. So um, there's, a, there's a point to this. Take a while, but I mentioned earlier I'm an open source, right? We're an open source provider, and there's a big debate about licensing, and usability, and cloud services right now going on. And something interesting's happened that reminds me of this movie. Who's seen it? Come on. Yeah, OK, there we go, right. So you kind of know the plot. And if you don't, I'm sorry I'm about to spoil this movie for you. But there have been like three movies and a remake by now. So it's your fault. Um, Ocean's Eleven, you've got these two chaps here, very dapper. And they go and they rob a casino in broad, well, not broad daylight, Las Vegas daylight. Um, and the way they do it, they rob this chap's casino over here, these three. And the way they do it is they actually uh, stage the entire robbery, the whole thing in front of the camera. They put that on the, on the video so that the, uh, the casino order here has to um, call in the cops. The SWAT team arrives. They walk into the, into the safe and try to arrest the perps. What the guy didn't know, obviously, is that these three were the SWAT team. So they literally walked right past him, straight through the door, into the vault, took the money, and walked right out again. And it was all staged. So it's a heist. Right? It's a great heist movie. And it's happening now in the database world. Uh, might maybe a controversial slide. I might. Uh, none of the opinions expressed in this presentation are that of the company. Uh, so, yeah, so we know this one. I'm actually sure pretty much who, who sort of knows where I'm going to go with this. Any ideas? Excellent. I'm going to tell you a fun little story then. Uh, so, it's called the Great API Heist. And what I'm trying to get at here is basically your API is, when it's successful, it can be a double-edged sword. So when I say Redis, that's the reason I started with Redis, is when you are thinking about Redis, it is a very popular in-memory store. Loads of people use it. They just, they're one of my favorite companies. They're great. They're Ansi Rez, the chap who, who started it. Is, um, he's a really interesting guy. And he got hired by Redis Labs, and they raised a bunch of money and built an enterprise product to try and bring this to the enterprise world. Wonderful, fantastic, great. But AWS comes along and they go, well, no, we're going to fork your code. We're going to build AWS Elasticsearch, uh, Elasticash, and then we are going to um, sell it to our users. Great. OK, fine. Now, the thing is, Elasticash is a bit, this isn't actually so bad for Redis. It's bad for Memcached, because what they've done is they've basically said, well, AWS Elasticash is API compatible. It's wire protocol compatible with your Redis driver. You bring a Redis driver to the table, 
you can use our Elasticash service. Don't need to bother with Redis. Anyway, so not so bad, this one, because they actually forked the code and they maintained their own fork. Fine, fine, fine. But what about Mongo? Indeed, what about Mongo? Well, these guys, this heist here is, this is daring, daring do. Um, MongoDB is a document store, and Amazon and Azure both created their own document stores with their global availability and you know, we, we won't fail, you have sharding, all this magical stuff. And then when they launched it, they said, oh, it's MongoDB driver compatible. But the key difference here is it's not running MongoDB. It's a completely isolated, proprietary solution they built where they said, we're going to implement your API, your wire protocol, your driver protocol. We're going to put that in front of our service, and then we're going to start selling it to our own users completely pushing you out of the market. And as a platform provider, great, fantastic moat, right? And this is MongoDB suffering from their own success. But wait, the Esmoa. Who knows what this is about? Oh, come on, folks, you're in the API business. This is a really big deal, and it's still not finished. So for those that don't know, when Android was launched for mobile phones, and got really popular. At that point, Oracle had bought Sun Microsystems. Sun Microsystems developed Java, and they own all of the patents around it. And you know Java is open source, but the implementation that Sun has did have patents. There was an enterprise version. You guys are Java coders. You know the different JDKs are out there. And Oracle thought, <clears throat> Android's very popular. And the reason it's popular is because everything is built on the Java API and you're not paying us for it, and we don't like that. So they took them to court. And it's because what Google did, at least this is what the Wikipedia summary told me, uh, what Google did was they created a clean room implementation of Java, where they basically said, what's the Java API? What are the bits in the Java runtime that are patented? Rewrite those so they're not, and then next thing you know, you've got a clean room version of Java. They built and copied an API on top of a proprietary engine, and then built Android on top of it, and made a massive infrastructure play. Really, really great. I mean, Android is fantastic. How many Android phones in here right now? Oh, I expected more, actually. But yeah, OK, cool, cool. You do what you do, says the Apple owner. Uh, anyway, so Oracle v. America. Now, the reason why this is important is because the actual lawsuit is about whether or not you can copyright and patent an API. Because if you can, that means Oracle is right, and Google owes them a lot of money. And if Google is right, it means that APIs are fair game. They are fair game for somebody to steal your API and, in turn, nab your customers. And that's, that's not cool, right? That's dark. That's a dark pattern. And that's what I'm talking to you about today. A lot of context for a title, right? Anyway, so it's not all gloom and, uh, doom and gloom. There's a lighter side. Look at the lighter slide. Um, there is a lighter side. There's um, a certain amount of risk with regards to interface theft, essentially. And it really depends on your core product, right? Um, another graph, you like graphs? This is, I don't even know what kind of graph this is. It's, I made it up. Um, but I, I thought it might illustrate the point in terms of where your risk strategy might be. If your product relies entirely on user interface and developer experience, which none do, but you know, a lot of people claim that product and UI and UX is the big deal, um, your risk is very, very high because it's out there, it's public, and it can be copied. Bam. And this is actually business um, MBA 101 in terms of strategy, right? If uh, you're running a functional service, so you're doing something, input, it, input goes in, output comes out, um, then depending on how that, how, how repli replicable, there we go, the functionality is, that changes your risk sort of elasticity. Uh, so MongoDB is a document store. You send a query in, data comes out. So okay, that's probably high risk. But if it's very, very specific, so the functionality itself is non-specific or has weird outputs or cannot be easily replicated with another service, then you're okie dokie. Uh, the same thing goes for curated and 
uh, generated data. So if you're a data aggregator and you're pulling your data from public sources, easy to copy, easy to copy. Um, and every single time that the, the value definition for what your product is sits close to the API level, you're in trouble of interface theft because you're not necessarily adding value properly. And I'll, I'll get to that point in a minute. Um, so we'll skip that one. What I want to, the, the point is, your API isn't your competitive edge, right? It's not the thing that's going to change the market. It's not the thing that's going to go out there and say, we are going to uh, change the world with our service. You're not. You're going to change the world with the value you provide through your service. Um, so don't let your competitive edge become a competitive wedge. <laughs> Sorry, I had to do it. Um, so how do you protect yourself? Um, well, there's the legal option. If you're Oracle and you have billions of dollars, you can go take Google to court. Good luck with that. Um, better ones, though, are to look at using the data for your service, look, using the data model of the thing that you create and putting it out there and actually coupling it quite strongly with what you produce so that when somebody copies it, at least it's blatant. So if you do have to take them to court, it's real copyright theft. Um, and don't build a Skinner box. Now, all applications are input, output, right? And it's all, you know what's going to come out if I send certain types of input into an application, certain kinds of output comes out. Now, for those who don't know who uh, Mr. Skinner is, he believed that there's no such thing as free will, and um, we are all just the culminations of behaviors and inputs and outputs, right? There's no hidden source. And with software, that's definitely true. So how can you avoid building a Skinner box when you're a software developer? You can't. Um, but you can, actually. And it's not about your software. It's about your business. It's about your value proposition. Ultimately, what you need to figure out how to do is not make your API the product. Because if your API is the product, you don't have one. The product, your value proposition, needs to be something intrinsic to your company. It needs to be something hard to copy, and it needs to be something that isn't dependent on how you deliver it. You need to be able to deliver it in multiple ways. An API is there to deliver value to your customer, not because of the API, but because of what the API is giving that customer. So when you're looking at designing your API as a product, consider where you are putting your value. And that is it. Thank you. Thanks, Martin. I can see why your co-founder thinks you're a liability <laughs> uh, before you run off. Are there no, any questions turning, for Martin? the property. No, the room is silent. The Excellent. room is silent. I get well, away with I've, it. I've got a question for you. Maybe oh, I'll toss that out. Um, so you talked about obviously all these lawsuits, things of that kind. Um, you also started touching upon things you can do to protect yourself. That's right. Maybe I can pull on that thread a little bit sure. more, and you can talk a bit about what have you seen your customers do um, that could be useful for people in the audience here. Well. It's not so much my customers that are doing it that have done anything to protect themselves. It's more of a trend I've seen. And in many cases, for things like what we do, we're an API gateway. We have an API. We need to figure out how to protect ourselves. Um, so for us, for example, the integration point with our software sits at the dashboard level, which is the closed source component. It sits under a EULA. If somebody copies that API, they are actually infringing copyright. Whereas if somebody's working with open source software, and that's where Redis and Mongo were at risk, is those APIs were public. They were there in the source code that they released. So what you need to figure out how to do, especially at the legal end, is take the value piece. So yes, have an API, but the valuable API that you're selling that actually creates the difference needs to sit with your service in, a, in, in something you can protect with a EULA. So that's one example for you. Cool. Thanks very much. Thanks, guys. And, and go visit their booth. They, yeah. they do have really cool stickers. We um, have a booth. Got, you can get all of these as stickers. <laughs> and we have cake. It is also delicious. I might or might not have been uh, eating on some cupcakes out there. <laughs> <laughs>